Hello, good, after, good afternoon to everyone. I hope you can properly listen to me. <laughs> um, my name is Jose Angel Morena and, and I work for uh, IT internal in Red Hat. I'm a senior system engineer and today I come here to explain you uh, a story about um, OpenShift and automation of, of compliance, right? So, the aim of this talk is to explain you one of our challenges, right, that, that we were facing um, some time ago. Um, what is the solution that we, that we envisioned and that we implemented in order to, to solve that challenge, okay? That is going to be the, the main point of the, of, the, of the talk, right? So, let us begin with, with the problem, right? We, we would like to be able to to use this new Qubit uh, thing, right, in OpenShift. We would like to be able to, to deploy uh, VMs in the same platform as we deploy containers, right, and, and we would like to be able to have this platform for, for everything, right, in Red Hat. So, so we decided to, to go with OpenShift virtualization for that, right? Um, the problem is, um, how do we make sure that we are able to, 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 to land a security posture, right, in the, in the VMs? And, we need how, how, we, how we can achieve that, right? Because we need to do it in a way that it's automatic. Because in the end, the people who are going to deploy VMs in the platform, right? Most of them are going to be developers or people who have their own problems. And they, they are not going to be there to, to be worried about the security posture of the VM or what compliance rules are enforced or aren't enforced, right? So the problem was basically to find a way that all of this would be automated so the people who are creating virtual machines in OpenShift would be more productive, right? And could focus on developing whatever they are developing, right? Because that's their job in the end. So that is the problem that we, that, that we were trying to solve, right? Some of the, of the guidelines that we had to consider for this solution is that it, would, it had to be based completely on OpenShift. Nothing about any other external system, everything in the OpenShift platform. Um, it would have to be like, um, how to say, the, the easy for the customer to set up, right? They set it up and they start using whatever, whatever Qubit operator provides, right? They, they don't need uh, to mess with anything else. They don't need to learn any kind of framework or technical detail, right? So those w that, that's the problem that we were trying to, to address back in the day, right? So now we will talk about the solution that we, we created and and how, more or less, well, how, how it's working, and you will see. So, personally, from my point of view, right, when, when thinking about solutions to problems, I would like to envision the bigger picture before starting to decide things, right? And this is more or less the workflow that we, we envisioned back, back in the day, right? That user or customer would create a, an OpenShift virtual machine, and the virtual ma once the virtual machine is created, something would have to run in order to make, to make it compliant, right? When I say to make it compliant, I'm trying to say that something would configure the VM so it has some kind of security posture, right? Basically, the VM would comply to a security standard, yes, compliance rules. Mm, so this is more or less the, the idea of the bigger picture, right? User creates a virtual machine, something makes it compliant, right? Besides from that, of course, compliance is something that must run on a schedule to make sure that the VM remains compliant over time, right? So that's something to, to take into consideration. And we would need something, some kind of mechanism so the customer can, can tweak the, the automation if needed, right? But we will talk about it uh, later. But that's, that's the idea of the, the bigger picture of the, the solution, right? This is what we wanted to achieve to solve the problem that I explained in the previous slide, okay? So, what are the tools that we're going to use in order to, to solve this problem, right? What, what can we use? So, we decided to go for the following um, technological stack, right? We decided to go for OpenShift serverless, also known as Knative. OpenShift pipelines, also known as, as Tecton, right, and, and Ansible. And basically, we created this kind of architecture, which is event-driven, right, in which someone creates a VM, no matter how they create it. Um, basically, uh, Knative will catch the event and will run a Tecton pipeline in order to make it compliant, right? So 
for people, it's, it should be as simple as I create my VM, no matter how I do it, the VM will get compliant. And because it's a Tecton pipeline, then I get to see it in a um, sort of beautiful BL, right? The, this execution of, of this Ansible playbook, right? So that would be the, the idea, right? And in order to do so, we, we went for Knative because it provides you with the ability to react to trigger on specific events. And we went for, for Tecton because it basically has this event listener that will allow you to, to say, OK, um, there was this event. so. Knative reaches out to the Tecton event listener, and the Tecton event listener will spawn a, a pipeline, right? The, the good thing about this solution is that there is, there is not a lot of custom code, if you know what I mean. It's just Kubernetes manifest of the Knative resources, Tecton resources, and the custom code you have is in the pipeline that will make sure that the VM is compliant, right? That's, that's one of the cool things of this solution, that it's not unlike when you develop an operator or something that you have to put a ton of custom logic. This one is more like, using the already existing things in the OpenShift ecosystem, right? So let's talk a little bit about the, the overall flow of the, of the solution. Just as I mentioned, the, in theory, for the user, no matter what they use, right, they can create a virtual machine. Um, the, we give them tools to, to create the virtual machines, but if they want to do it on their own using GTOPS, using Ansible, they, they are free to do so. No one is going to, to force them, right? But we use, well, here we have this thing about the configuration options. Basically, that's because when Ansible runs in the, in the pipeline that is spawned, we want to, um, uh, to, well, to enable the user to pass some extra parameters, right? Some Ansible extra bars. So in order to do so, we created this config map that the pipeline will read and will say, OK, there are these extra bars. I'm going to, to run them with the playbook, and this is the way that users can use to basically like um, specify Ansible extra bars, right? So the, in the end, this is a modern implementation detail, right? But I want you to know that basically people create a VM, then what's going to happen? When people create a VM, well, I don't know if you see it properly, but <laughs> when people create the VM, um, this is how the solution is going to work, right? Knative and Tecton will integrate together. So the Knative API server source works like some kind of listener. It will basically uh, react either when a VM is created or is deleted, and will send an HTTP post to the Tecton event listener with, the, with, well, with information about this event of creation or deletion. Then when the Tecton event listener receives this event, it will say, OK, there was an event right, of creation or, or deletion. I have to, um, to create a pipeline. And in order to do so, it will use the, the trigger template right, and the trigger binding well, to, to format the, the, the parameters in the HTTP post to pass them to the, to the pipeline. right. But the idea is that the Tecton event listener will create a pipeline. And this pipeline will run and will make the VM compliant. Right? So in the end, this integration is enabling us to do something specific when a certain event happens. A VM is created, I can trigger a pipeline, and my pipeline is going to do whatever I need. In this case, it's going to make the VM compliant, but for any, for any other team or organization, it could be an, another thing, right? Or a different process, right? So that, that's the, the interesting thing about the, the, the solution, right? So, this is what more or less happens when the, the pipeline is executed, right? The VM is created, the Knative and Tecton integration starts to work, and Tecton creates the pipeline. And this is what happens when um, there is a virtual machine is created, then the new pipeline is created. We, we expose the, the VM, right, using the, the node port. We make it compliant. We give it a um, domain name in the internal DNS, right? And how we but how, we do, how do we make it compliant? Basically, the Tecton pipeline is going to wait for the VM to be up and running, and it will run an Ansible playbook to make it compliant. And, and that's it, right? We also have a, a specific workflow. When, when you delete a virtual machine, there is another process that runs, um, which is well interesting to, to make sure that, for example, the DNS record is gone because you deleted virtual machine, so you don't want DNS record. So 
this is the what what the specific things that we are doing when when virtual machine is created and deleted right so wrapping it up it's well a little bit what we're talking about right people could create this virtual machine and all of these components are going to to play together to make sure that there is there is a consequence right there is a, an action triggered after the event of creation or deletion right uh, and basically this is the the big picture of the solution right like customer creates virtual machine all these components start doing something between each other and then the result is that the virtual machine is compliant why this is this is interesting basically because whoever is going to create the virtual machine is going to create it for a purpose and they 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 want to be productive so they don't want to be spending time in making it secure compliant to infosec policies or or whatever right so we need to give them the tooling to 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 make it happen automatically so they can focus on on their jobs right on developing testing or or doing whatever they have to do right so i'm going to talk about some implementation details um Basically, uh, when a VM is created, the user needs to annotate it, okay? Like, for this to work, specific, because the, the user, the, this tooling is optional, so it doesn't necessarily need to, to well, to, the user doesn't necessarily have to use it, right? But if they want to use it, they need to put a specific annotation in the, in the virtual machine in order to trigger the, the compliance pipeline. As I mentioned earlier, the, there is a way for the for the user to to pass ansible extra bars to the tecton pipeline it's it's using a config map right and actually well the using the annotation you annotate the vm you mention the the value of the annotation can be the name of the config map and the pipeline will will say okay you you want to pass some extra bars uh, these extra bars are in the config map that is in the annotation i'm going to to read the config map and i'm going to to run the ansible playbook with the parameters in there right um, I have put some implementation details because I think it's interesting to, to go a little bit deeper and, and explain some, some stuff, right, that is not covered in the high level. For example, and where, where is the Ansible content? Where is the, the Ansible playbook that will make the, the VM compliant? Where, where is it, right? In our case, for example, the Ansible cont uh, content would be in the, in the container image that is running the Tecton pipeline. That container image is the, the artifact that encapsulates the compliance playbooks. And basically, when the pipeline runs, it already has the playbooks in order to make the VM compliant, right? So we are building, the, well, we are building this on a schedule, basically because um, if there is some, something, well, some, some team is changing some aspect uh, regarding the, the compliance automation, uh, we are rebuilding the, this container image every night to make sure that the, the latest version of the, of the playbook and the dependencies are, are uh, available in the pipeline. That, that's an important aspect, right? Because, I mean, if you, you are running a playbook which is running multiple roles from, from different teams, a team is doing a change, how, how, do, I, how do I land it in, my, in the pipeline, right, for all my customers? Basically, there is this shared container image which is rebuilt every night. And when you rebuild it, you will be landing the new, the new changes, right? Of course, the, the, the logs of, this, of these pipelines are um, put in, in Splunk, are forwarded to, to Splunk for auditability purposes. And there is something, something interesting, is that, that there are people, for example, who, who would separate the projects. They would deploy their VMs in, a in an OpenShift project. They would run the pipelines in another OpenShift project, right? Um, the solution is flexible enough, for example, to, to if you want to, to deploy VMs in four projects or three projects and have that centralized project where you run your pipelines that make the VMs compliance, that's also, that's also possible, right? And, and it's an interesting thing, right? Because there are people who, who are fine with one project for VMs, but there are people who maybe are managing hundreds of VMs and they, they, they labels is not enough for them, so they need to go for, for multiple OpenShift projects. So that, that's cool because they don't need to have one project for VMs, one project for pipeline. They can have as many projects for VMs they want and one project for pipeline if that's, if that's what they, they prefer, right? So, 
So I'm going to show you in here um, a little bit well of, of examples and an outcome of the of the solution of what we've seen today. Um, this is an example of configuration, right? Like how would a, per, a customer create a virtual machine? Basically, they would do it. For example, it's an example using the the OC client, right? Using the OC client, they would send this manifest to the Kubernetes API, and the Kubernetes API would say, "Oh, um, this user wants a virtual machine, right? I'm going to make it happen." And the Kubernetes operator would create and use the provisioning process that it has to, to create the, the VM, right? But the interesting thing in here is the annotation, right? I was mentioning, like, how do you, how can people opt out of the offering? They, they can opt out by not putting the annotation, and it will be a standard VM, right? But if they want compliant VM and they put the annotation, um, then that, that will force the Tecton event listener to, to create the pipeline, right? And this is an example, right? Like you put this annotation, and if you see the, the value of the annotation, IT config is the name as in that config map, right? And this is how how people would would say, okay, this virtual machine is related to this configuration, right? And you can put whatever Ansible extra variables need, uh, and and this way, the pipeline would say, okay, this VM is going to need the configuration in this in this config map, right? And and the pipeline would read the data in the config map and use it for the compliance process, right? Um, this is an interesting for us because it's, it's, for example, compatible with stuff like Argo CD or, or any other kind of infrastructure as code uh, process, right? Where I would put the, the manifest for my Kubernetes VMs in there, and then, for example, I can have a pipeline that will basically run the OC apply. Um, in the same code, in the same repository, I would be able to create config maps, right? And annotate the VM with its corresponding config map, right? So that's interesting because we don't want to, to do a script that creates virtual machines. We want to declare a state, and we want something that makes it happen. All this solution is basically, we, I declare a state, and there is some event-driven automation in the background that will make it happen somehow and will make my VM compliant, right? And this is more or less the idea of what people would, would put on the repos or, or would create with the, with the OC command, right? Or kubectl command. So this is the, the outcome, right? Like I create my, my VM with the name devconf. Um, the K native and Tecton are going to talk to each other, and a pipeline is going to be created that will basically like make the, the VM compliant, right? These are some of some of the steps that we have in the pipeline, like um, creating a cluster IP service for the VM to be accessible through the Kubernetes SDN, creating an Ansible inventory, because without Ansible inventory it's going to be hard. In that Ansible inventory, for example, we inject the Ansible extra variables uh, present in the, in the config map, right? In case the user provided some Ansible extra variables. Um, there is the step prepare, which basically is waiting for the, for the VM to be up and running so Ansible can, can connect. And then system base is the name of the playbook that we have to make a VM compliant, right? When this playbook runs in this step, we'll basically um, implement in the VM this security po official internal security posture, right? And note for this, if all these steps were successful, I will expose the VM so you can start working with it, right? So that's, that's interesting because this automation also provides uh, customers a way to use the VM. Like, it's compliant, and then it has a node port, and I know how to use it, right? And it's going to be the same for all the VMs, right? We also have, well, a specific workflow for decommissioning or removing the VM. This is interesting because, right, for example, I delete the VM. Um, do I need to go and remove the DNS record related to the VM manually? That would be terrible, right? If I'm managing three virtual machines, it's okay. But if I'm managing thousands of virtual machines, then that would be crazy, right? So we, we also well, expanded the automation. So we, when someone deletes a VM, there is a specific uh, workflow for the deletion of the VM, right? 
Um, well, the outcome more or less is what I've been saying, right? That people would deploy the solution in their OpenShift projects once, right? They deploy it and then they can start creating VMs. They can create the VMs however they wish, either using Argo CD, using the OC client, using whatever they need. Um, as a result, the VM would be compliant, the, the VM would be accessible, and the VM would, be, uh, would have a DNS record, right? So it would be resolvable. And that, that, that's a great thing because they, all this happens automatically, right? They create five VMs, all of them are automatically compliant, accessible, and resolvable, and they can focus on their, on their work, right? And, and it's something automatic, right? One of the outcomes well, that can be managed like any other Kubernetes resource, well, that, that's, that's a Qubit output, really, right? That's one of the great things about Qubit is that now we can, we can put VMs in, in YAMLs, right? And there is something that will, will create the, the VMs for us, right? There is some specific controller that will create the, the VMs for us. The interesting thing about this solution is that the, the act of creating a VM and the act of doing something with VM are separated processes, right? Like, I don't care how the VM is created. If the user uh, goes to the OpenShift UI and creates the VM, or if the user is going to do a, a cool command against the, the OpenShift API, I don't care. As long as he has the annotation in the VM definition, the automation will be triggered, and the VM will be compliant, accessible, and resolvable, right? So. User can create however he wishes to create, and there is this integration that will make it happen, right? It, it will make happen some kind of post action, right? After the, the VM or deletion of VM, right? This is the, the outcome. And now we have a demo. <laughs> so you would see it in action, right? Basically, this would be like, I'm going to create um, a VM using the OC command. Um, this is my way to, to pass the, the parameters, right? To select a template, authorize the SSH keys, the, the config map where I have my Ansible extra variables, right? This is how I create the VM. Because it's an OpenShift template, I would use the OC process, but, but in the end, it's the same as as the command that I showed you earlier with the OC apply, right? The virtual machine was created. We can see that it's provisioning. And the pipeline was spawned automatically, right? That is the interesting part. That I create a VM and there is a pipeline automatically created. Of course, I mean, um, there is also this, this, this cron job that will run nightly that will make the, the VM compliant as well. Um, and it's, it's actually the, the same pipeline but running the, uh, nightly for, for its VM. We also well, we also plan to, to expand the solution so it supports some kind of, of alerting, right? So, for example, if a given pipeline fails, I don't need to go to OpenShift to check it, right? I get an alert either on my Slack application or email or something that I am checking often, right? Because if not, eventually you end up having VMs in, in multiple cloud providers, and if you need to go check one by one, it, it's crazy, right? So it's best if... If we, well, we, we plan to, to put some, some alerting into this. And basically, th this is step, the inventory step, what it's doing is um, reading the, the config map related to the VM and creating an Ansible inventory. So the, the consequent steps can um, make the, the VM compliant, right? And now, well, now it's waiting for the Qubit VM to, um, to be running because it's provisioning. We don't have to wait. This. Okay. Oh. Well, wait for connection. It's going to wait, but it, it's also going to do some stuff before running the, the compliance playbook.
And then the, the base configuration is the step that would run and would make the, the VM compliant, right? Because, well, because of privacy purposes, like we, we omitted the, the real playbook and we have put a, a debug task, uh, but this proves that the connection to the VM that we just provisioned works. And in here, you can put whatever Ansible playbook you would like, right? In our case, we are using this Ansible playbook that would enforce this security posture in the virtual machines, right? A Noteport would be the, the, the service that would make the VM easy, well, not easy, right? But that would make the VM accessible, right? Outside, outside of the OpenShift network. I don't know if this is. Now, if I delete the VM, there is another pipeline that will basically well, run the deletion of VM workflow, right? Which was omitted as well, but well, we, we have put this, this text, right? And this would be the, the demonstration of the solution. A little bit for, for you to see this end result I was talking about, right? But recorded in the video. Oh my God. Um, now it's time for questions, if you have any. <laughs> mm, well, Yes. <laughs> that's that's a good question, right? Because eventually, if you have many VMs, you you can end up um, with your namespace full of pipeline runs, right? The, the current policy is basically when there is a successful pipeline run, we would leave it there for a couple of days. If there is a failed pipeline run, we would leave it there for a week. But all of this data is ingested into Splunk, so you can get to see it. Or even if some team wishes, they can trigger some specific alert or, or automation from, from Splunk, right? Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, basically, like this is set in the Tecton config resource at the cluster level. Yeah. Um, next question. Yeah. So, so basically, in order to. Yeah, in order to, to build the, the container image, we are currently using build config in OpenShift. And instead of using a cron job, for example, that would schedule your Tecton pipeline, we're using Ansible Automation Platform because it's our default go to application when there is something to be scheduled, which works with alerting and monitoring. And we have an ugly schedule there that will, would basically run the OC start build command and would trigger the build of that container image. And when the container image is built, it will download all the dependencies to run the compliance playbook, the latest version of the roles, and, and everything, right? So if, for example, I have one team that is doing, InfoSec team is doing a change in a playbook, right? That night, the container image is rebuilt, and the new pipelines that are going to run are going to, to include these changes. That is because in the Tecton pipeline, the pool policy is set to always, right? Because if I set pull policy always, if I rebuild the container image, the next time that the pipeline runs, it will download the, l the latest version of the container image. Right? That, that is how, how we are making it in order to land, to land changes in the Ansible playbook. So yes, we are using a schedule in Ansible Automation Platform. And if it fails, it will it would trigger in our um, notification channel. So that's how we are doing it. Any other questions? Now, now it's the time. <laughs> okay, then, if not, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. And you, you have this meme. <laughs>
and thank you for coming and goodbye.